I know you guys have waited a long time for this dwarf video. So here it is. Today we're gonna to talk about how to set up a dwarf seahorse tank. So the one thing that I do have to start off saying, if you're looking to start your very first seahorse tank, I'm going to advise you to look at the larger species of seahorses. I'm going to do this video to show you how to set up a dwarf seahorse tank, but truly they are more difficult than the bigger species. It's one of the reasons that I've never kept them. Now I might set up my own dwarf seahorse tank, but I've been dealing with seahorses for years now. Just keep that in mind. I'm going to help you no matter what and I'm going to walk you through setting up this tank. But a fry tank and a dwarf tank setup are very similar. If you don't think you're ready for one, you're probably not ready for the other. The biggest difference is that fry keep growing. And as they grow bigger and bigger, the person breeding them will upgrade their tank to a bigger tank to compensate for their growth or switch to more commercial applications like tubs. The old sump or tanks will be drained and cleaned so they're just like brand new for the next batch of fry. A dwarf seahorse, however, stops growing at around two inches. So they technically never need a bigger tank, except they keep multiplying. So the biggest challenge to a dwarf seahorse tank is keeping it clean enough for fry at all times continuously despite there being more seahorses to care for and the buildup that occurs in any tank over time. I'm going to show you how to set up a dwarf seahorse tank, but I just like to make sure you know what you're getting into and understand that dwarf seahorses are more difficult to care for than the larger species. Because I have never had the pleasure of keeping these two inch tiny little dwarf seahorses myself, I've asked a friend Lucy to give, some, give us some tips and tricks and tell us how to set up a dwarf seahorse tank properly. I was actually surprised to find out how many differences there are between these tiny little guys and the normal larger sized seahorses. Aside from keeping the temperature low under 74 degrees to keep bacteria at bay, there aren't many other similarities. Unlike the larger species of seahorses, dwarf seahorses prefer a smaller tank. Anything from 2 to 10 gallons usually works with 20 to 40 dwarf seahorses per 5 gallons. This is because they don't really like to hunt and they will eat much better in a smaller tank where food is much more likely to swim past them constantly. They also prefer to live in a community setting and you should always buy at least six starting off. It's better to have equal males and females, basically so the boys don't have to fight over the girls. Dwarf seahorses will mature at about three months old and start multiplying very quickly. The dwarf gestation period is only 10 to 14 days and they will breed three generations a year. So you're gonna have quite a few dwarfs. When kept in proper conditions and they stay healthy, dwarf seahorses can live one to two years in captivity. The fry, however, do not need to be removed from the adult tank. Both fry and adults will stay in the same tank because they all have the same exact needs, also equivalent to a larger species fry tank. As far as filtration for the tank, I asked some of the top breeders and keepers, and they believe the four successful methods are the two tank switch, a sponge filter setup, adjustable hob, or 20 gallon sump. The two tank switch method literally consists of having two tanks and switching the dwarf seahorses from one tank to the other every few days. The original tank is cleaned thoroughly with bleach, and the dwarf seahorses literally get a brand new clean tank every swap. This method could actually work indefinitely, but not many people want to continually 
clean tanks every few days. So when we're cleaning the tank, it's really important to make sure that you clean all of the sides. So yeah, I'm not doing this every two days. The sponge filter method uses an air pump driven sponge filter to hold all the good bacteria and also soak up all waste. This is another method that will work, but only as long as the keeper keeps up on the maintenance. There are many different kinds of sponge filters, but the basic idea is that an air pump outside the tank pushes air via an airline into the center section of the filter. This creates a suction which allows the sponge to pull in any water or debris that's passing by. As the bubbles rise up from the filter and hit the surface, it creates oxygen and moves the water. The sponges hold all the good bacteria that keeps the tank cycled, but also all the waste, so it must be cleaned carefully every week during the water changes. The easiest way to do this is to swish the sponge in old tank water during the water change to remove the waste on the outside, but not disturb the bacteria inside. You'll see inside. the um, water get a brownish, cloudy tint to it. That does mean you're losing a little bit of bacteria, but it also means you're getting rid of all of those organics, uh, you know, dead, dead baby brine shrimp, anything that's been on the sponge. So you swish it around, you know, you can give it a little, you know, swishy, shaky. Do not squeeze. When you squeeze, you're gonna get a whole poof of brown, and that is good bacteria that you're killing and taking off the sponge. You just swish, and then return it immediately to the tank water. You use tank, old tank water to clean it. It never touches tap water. This is the filtration in a sponge filter setup. Adjustable hob filters, especially those with spray bars, are really cool because you can provide flow to the tank, but adjust it up or down depending on how the dwarf seahorses react. Just be sure to cover any intakes. There are even these really cute internal sponge filters with spray bars. This is what I like to use. Um, as long as basically any adjustable filter will work, but you just want to make sure that you can cover the intake so they don't get sucked onto the intake. You can also wrap floss around that intake and use like nylon or whatever and keep using more and more floss if it's too strong or just adjust the filter. But either way, the adjustable filter allows you to play with it until you figure out the exact rating. I like these internal filters because they have the spray bar. So basically I've got my, you know, flow all taken care of and um, I can adjust it as I see fit. I can make it aim directly at the back wall or, you know, at the ground. I will still use a hob in addition or have a sump underneath in addition to this. This is going to act as my power head, basically, in the dwarf fry tank. So, Adding a sump is always the best option because you have the opportunity to use other equipment and more media and just more water volume to do a better job. No matter which filtration method you choose to use, you need to test frequently to make sure that you have enough good bacteria to keep ammonia and nitrite at zero or do enough water changes so that ammonia and nitrite can never build up. Any type of dwarf seahorse tank should be siphoned daily to remove any waste and all surface areas wiped clean daily to prevent any buildup. Adding a 15% weekly water change or using the tank swap method will keep the water clean and the dwarfs help. The term siphon means to take water from one area to the next. They make these little tom-tom filters that will actually pull water in and push it back out into the um, bucket. However, I've gotten very good at this, so um, excuse me <laughs> for being real, but this is how I create a siphon. I do not advise someone new to do this um, because you don't want a bunch of tank water in your mouth. It's pretty disgusting. However, once you've done it for a while, the way you create a siphon is you stick one end of an airline into the tank water and you suck on the other end and pour, put it into the bucket. So, and now I am siphoning the tank. This is a siphon. 
and I can literally go down to the bottom, which I don't want to get my pretty dress dirty, but I could go down to the bottom and literally pull up anything that I want. And somebody's hungry, so we need to hurry up. But this is a siphon. When you're done with the siphoning, you pull this out of the water and the siphon will stop. Ta-da! Okay. All right, so this is my handy dandy one of a kind on sale for five zillion dollars. No, I'm just kidding. But it's literally a scraper and a vacuum attached with zip ties. I use this on the bigger seahorse tanks. You can make them with one of these little tiny brushes you can get online. I'll link in the description and a um, an airline. You can use an airline and a small brush on a dwarf tank. And it helps with cleaning because it doesn't let the stuff get in the water. So basically the way that it works, start to siphon, okay? And then as I'm siphoning the tank, whoa, literally when I scrape something, when I scrape the algae, I can literally pick it right up. So scrape it, and it goes right up the vacuum. See that? Scrape it right up the vacuum and this makes my life a heck of a lot easier all right so scrape that algae right there suction it up scrape it suction it up all right good enough so when cleaning your intake or your filters it's really important to make sure that you are using a they, they sell these little brushes brushes that will get down in to the tiny spots to make sure that you're getting every bit of anything bad cleaned out before you put the dwarf seahorses back in. And you need to do these cleanings every single week. Dwarf seahorses tanks are just like fry tanks. They have to stay clean. So unfortunately, I can't find my little brush. So just an FYI, a rigid airline comes in handy. Due to the small size of the dwarf seahorses, hitchhikers, and other threats that aren't as big of a deal to the larger species of seahorses are a really big deal with dwarfs. So, for a dwarf tank setup, most of the successful keepers or breeders are going to tell you to do a bare bottom, rock free tank. Now, a lot of people really like that natural setup. Um, if you're, you know, we're gonna go back to risk tolerance. So, you know, if you, if you want to do the live setup, that's fine. Stay tuned. We're gonna cover how to treat the rock in just a few minutes. But my advice, along with most other successful keepers, would be to use your filtration in a sump, or in the hob, or so on and so forth, and not to rely on rock that can carry hitchhikers to the tank too easily. Plus in the small tank, the rock, you know, is gonna take up so much space, it just, it just isn't an ideal situation. So by keeping the tank bare bottom, it's easier to clean. Um, no rock means there's no hiding spots or little crevices where thing, organics can build up. And, you know, it, it's, it's not the, the ideal, natural, pretty setup. But if you want to keep dwarfs, this is how. Use bare bottom substrate, fake plants or hitches, chains, so on and so forth. And then use media either in a sump or in your hob to keep that nitrogen cycle going strong. Speaking of the safe environment, you don't want to have any tank mates in a dwarf seahorse tank. Nothing but the dwarf seahorses should be in that tank. No coral that could sting them and or bring hitchhikers and no other fish who would outcompete the dwarf seahorses for food. The dwarfs don't hunt like the big seahorses do, and they'd prefer to just wait on their hitch for the food to come to them. 
they would never get enough to eat if they were competing with fish for food. They also require live foods. Which is why you'll typically see a cloud of food in any dwarf tank. The instinct to only eat live, moving food is so ingrained in these little guys that it's very, very unlikely that they will be trained on frozen. Even if you buy captive bred dwarf seahorses, you will need to be sure that you are going to be able to provide them with live foods constantly and continuously. The recommended feeding schedule is two to four feedings a day of the live foods in which it will make the tank look like it's snowing or in the middle of a blizzard. The way to determine if you're feeding the proper amount is to check back after four hours. At that time, the tank should look clear again. Making sure the food provides enough nutrition is also important. Copepods are a great food for dwarf seahorses, but the dwarfs can eat 3,000 copepods a day, each dwarf. Keeping that many copepods available can become difficult. So most people set up an Artemia or brine shrimp hatchery instead. I'm working on a separate video about setting up a brine shrimp hatchery. But the two important things to know is that they are not a natural food source for seahorses and therefore must be enriched to be nutritious enough to sustain the seahorses. I personally use Dan's Feed with Probiotics and Reef Nutrition's RG Complete. But I will tell you about both of those in more detail along with instructions how to enrich. But the bottom line is that you should research and learn about Artemia because many of the hydroid and other issues come from not keeping the hatchery clean enough. Understanding Artemia and enrichment will go a long way in helping you become a successful dwarf seahorse keeper. A trick of Lucy's is to put a light up beside the tank. The Artemia are attracted to the light and they'll gather there, making an easy feast for dwarf seahorses. If you're going to use live rock, you especially want to make sure to use Panker. Um, Fenman Diesel is also known as Panker. Um, I've got this Safeguard pen, uh, Fenman Diesel. I'm not sure if you can see it. But the bottom line is it's a dewormer and it is used to deworm. However, it also kills hydroids. Hydroids are such a big deal in a dwarf seahorse tank. So if you treat with this prior to adding the dwarf seahorses, if you treat any live rock, you do have to remember that that live rock is pretty much probably not going to be able to be used with coral and with other, you know, uh, reef tank type applications ever again. You're gonna need to keep that out because it can soak it up and leach it back out. Not a problem in a dwarf seahorse tank. Actually, that's a darn good thing because we want it to keep killing hydroids. But anyways, when you get the panker, make sure that you get the liquid kind. They sell it in a granule, uh, like granules, and it just doesn't work as well. First of all, it doesn't dissolve very well in salt water, and so you'll end up not getting all the granules out, and then they'll still be in the tank. And I don't think it's really a problem, but you just don't want that. Um, so, you know, just trust me. Get the liquid. It's easier, it dissolves better, it works better, etc. So, the treatment for deworming is actually different than what you're going to use for hydroids and for treating the tank and rock. Um, so, I'll do another video and so on and so forth about Panker in, or uh, Fenbet Diesel in general. But for this application, the recommended dose for treating the tank for hydroids is one milligram per gallon. So when converted to milliliters, like if you're using one of these little deals, I'll try to give you a close up, but you wouldn't, you would go one milligram is equal to 0.1 milliliter. So you want anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2 milliliters per 10 gallons. You're going to do that 0.1 to 0.2 per 10 gallons 
every other day for three doses. So basically six days total. Every other day for three doses. And then after the first or second application, if you don't see the hydroids dying, go ahead and up the dose. You can safely go four to five times that 0.1 to 0.2 per 10 gallons. And you know, you wanna start with the minimum amount because why waste the medicine? But it doesn't really hurt them. So if it's not working, up the dose, make sure those hydroids are dead. We wanna kill them before the dwarfs are hurt. Keeping hydroids out of the tank is almost impossible because they can sneak in in so many ways. So having fenbendazole on hand is very important. Formalin would be the other thing that dwarf seahorse keepers should keep on hand. If you buy dwarf seahorses from a breeder, you'll just want to observe them and not treat unless necessary. But if they are scratching and itching and do need treatment, I'll be making separate videos to show freshwater dip and short-term, long-term formalin treatments. I'm including this only to give very basic guidelines for formalin use. If you're going to dose the formalin directly to the tank, it's considered a hospital long-term treatment. You would use one milliliter per 10 gallons every other day for three doses, so six days total. At this dose, the biological filtration or beneficial bacteria will not be affected and you can dose this directly to the tank. The faster but harsher short-term bath option is one milliliter per gallon for no longer than 45 minutes and that would need to be in a separate tank. When using specific brands, always follow instructions or ask a professional for help. On this Formula MS, it says use two drops per gallon every other day until control is achieved. Basically what's going on is they have this container um, and the uh, little hole. They have this exactly precisely measured so that exactly enough comes out. Two drops per gallon would be 20 drops in a 10 gallon tank. If you compared and measured, I'm gonna bet that that would be equal to one milliliter. So same difference, different product, no big deal, but you would just follow the instructions. If you were trying to do a quicker bath for the 45 minutes, you would do the 20 drops per gallon times it by 10. But again, as long as you're buying the dwarf seahorses from a breeder, you should not need to do any of the treatments. Just observe them and you only use the formalin if needed, if they're scratching. You can always read the steps in the blog um, that I always do to go along with these videos, but just a basic summary is, for a dwarf seahorse tank, you're going to want two to 10 gallon tank, um, preferably with a 20 gallon sump underneath, adding more water volume and more room for equipment to help keep that tank clean. Skimmer and all that fun stuff that will always help. No rock in the tank or treat with panker. No tank mates, no coral. It's just too risky. If you're going to do those things, if you're going to try the natural setup, please stick to soft coral and still just really no tank mates really and um, you need to make sure that you are going to be able to provide them food they'll only eat live foods so you're going to have to have a continuous hatchery going at all times and if you can also have a copepod culture to give them variety in the diet you're going to have to enrich all of these foods stick with decapsulated brine shrimp learn about artemia because i would probably i would wager a bet that most of the dwarf seahorse tanks that are doing really well and then all of a sudden fail are because the hatchery was not clean enough that's a whole nother video and we'll do it but learn about your artemia learn about your hatchery learn about what it takes to keep them clean and make sure that you can do it before you set this up water changes weekly make sure that you're cleaning all surfaces of the tank uh, swish any sponge filters clean inside any intakes i mean really 
I've said it a couple times now, but the dwarf seahorse tank is comparable to a fry tank. You have to keep the tank extremely clean. It's very easy to make mistakes that you don't even realize are mistakes. And I'd love to see your dwarf tank setups. If you've done things differently than, than I've explained or that, that everyone has suggested in this video, I wanna see your setups. So please feel free to tag me on any videos or share any videos with me um, showing me what you've done. So thanks so much for watching. Hope this helped you out and uh, see you next episode.